Good morning and welcome to Epworth United Methodist Church. I'm the Reverend Terry Kofiel, who is here with the Reverend Bill Jones. We'll be leading you in worship this morning on the 97th Sunday in the month of April. It seems like it has been a long time since we've been together and it's going to be even longer than we expected. Today at a session of the annual conference, our bishop announced to us that we will be out of our churches at least until the 15th of May. That depends on what Governor Larry Hogan decides about opening schools and opening up the community. So we will keep in touch with you by our Facebook page, by our e-blasts, by our website about potential openings. If we get back together before the days of celebration, we will certainly be excited to celebrate them. If not, we're planning to have an East Grad Mom Dad Ascenta Cost service. We'll cover it all. We promise you that we will be able to celebrate all the highlights in the year of the church, even if we do it all in one day. But until then, we're here to worship and to praise. Please remember that we have opportunities for youth and college students to check in. Check your e-blast and the Facebook page for that information. We also have a coffee time with me, Monday through Friday at 9 a.m. through Zoom. And again, the information for checking into that is available through our e-blasts and also Sunday evenings at 7.30. We just have a short time of prayer and catching up with each other that you're welcome to tune into on Zoom. Again, check your e-blast. Since everything is canceled, we don't have many announcements, so now we're gonna to begin to worship with our prelude. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say, I say to, to the Lord, Lord you, are you are my God. Lord. Apart, Apart from, from you, you, I have, I have no, no good, good thing. thing. You make known to me the path of life. You will, you will fill, fill me, me with, with joy in your, in your presence, presence, with, with eternal, eternal pleasures at your, your right hand. hand. Now, if you would please join us in our hymn of praise, Alleluia, Alleluia, give thanks to the risen Lord in number 162.
everyone, it's Miss Debbie. I just wondered how your week was. Did you have a good Easter week, all you Easter people? I wonder sometimes too if you wonder. Do you wonder about anything? I know my friends at home. Do you wonder about anything? Yeah, I know. I know. He's he's wondering when I'm gonna get new batteries for him because he does a great little dance, but right now he can't do it. So he's wondering when I'm gonna get batteries. I'll, I'll work on that this week, I promise. Okay. We're gonna tell a story today about wondering and sometimes the wondering that turns into worrying. If you will remember, last week we had a story about Jesus on the cross and when he died they put him in a tomb and on Sunday morning the women who loved Jesus came back to finish the burial process at the tomb. But what they found was an empty tomb and they didn't know what happened they wondered about what happened and suddenly Mary heard a voice and all he said was Mary and she knew at once that it was Jesus can you tell why it's Jesus right so he said please go back and tell the others that I'll see them soon and she hurried off with the other women to tell the great, great news that Jesus was alive. Let's pick up our story. As soon as the women found Jesus and realized he was alive, they ran back to the others to tell them the good news. I have seen the Lord. We 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 have seen the Lord. And all the disciples jumped up and down with excitement because they were so thrilled to hear that news. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Duh. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Put your fingers here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. What a miraculous story. Those disciples went through so many amazing things that week after Easter, those few weeks after Easter, to go from watching their teacher and their leader and their beloved friend die to having him return to them and the miracle to know that he is God's son well, what an experience for them so Jesus did lots more miracles he visited them a lot more times before he went back to heaven and John wrote some of these things down so that we could not worry and doubt and wonder so that we could believe so how about if we say a prayer about that for all of the wonderings that you might have. Does everybody have your hands full? Okay, bow your hands. Okay. Dear God, thank you for the miracles of Jesus, for the miracles that he performed, 
for others so that we might believe. We know now that he is the Messiah, he is the Son of God, and that by believing in him, we have life in his name. Please help us turn our doubts and our worries, especially during these weeks, into trust and faith. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good job. All right, everyone. Have a great week. Don't worry, but keep wondering. Bye. Some of you have expressed your excitement over last week when our guest liturgists came to us from Liberia. We were blessed to have Anna and Nathan with us, and so today's mystery liturgist is John Turner. Good morning, John. Good morning, Pastor Terry and everyone. It's good to be with you this morning, and even though I can't literally see you, I'm envisioning you out there in the uh, before me in the sanctuary with your smiling faces. So, well, we, uh, we're so glad to see you. And John let us know before we started filming that the backdrop that he has, he and Carrie have an old church attendance board. And we told him he is not observing social distancing if he had that many people in his home. But he assures us this is an antique piece in their home. But we are glad to see you this morning. And John is going to be reading our epistle lesson and offering a prayer for us. Thank you. Yes, our epistle lesson this morning is from the first book of Peter, uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Thinking about a living hope. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith being more precious than gold, that though perishable is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor, Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all your blessings that we can come into the homes of those out there and pray and worship you. Wherever we are, even in our isolation during these times, we know you are always with us and will watch over us and keep us safe. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our music ministry this morning is from the faith we sing. It's number 2206. And I'd like to invite the congregation to sing along with us on the refrain. And I'll play it once through so you get the um, so you get what the tune is.
you just sang were taken from our epistle lesson and they also tell the story of the gospel lesson that we're about to read but they also tell the way we're feeling about you right now without seeing you we love you Epworth Church and friends without touching you we embrace we were talking this morning about how hard it is not to hug one another when we get back and we have to observe safe distancing we still won't be able to hug each other but we follow Christ without seeing, and he says to the disciples in the story we're about to read, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Because the second Sunday of Easter, we always read the same lesson, the story of Thomas, not doubting Thomas, but Thomas who proclaims that he has seen the Lord. And we read now from the 20th chapter of John, beginning at verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The season of Easter, the great 50 days of Easter, call for a lot of decorations in homes as well as in the sanctuary. Last week we had tulip bulbs, we had butterflies. Often there are painted eggs. Some of you are probably tired of egg salad by this time. They're all reminders of new life emerging from death. Because if you think about it, they're all images of an empty tomb. The bulb of a tulip or a lily looks kind of like an onion. And it's planted in the fall and it goes into the earth, into the cold earth for the whole of winter where, in effect, it dies before that beautiful flower emerges. The same thing happens with a butterfly. It starts out life not so pretty as a caterpillar. It spins its chrysalis and it stays there until it finally emerges in the springtime as a beautiful butterfly looking not much like it did when it went into the cocoon. The same thing happens with eggs, either those laid by hens or those with plastic eggs, a little marshmallow sugar covered peep comes out of. What starts out as one thing ends up as another, all symbols of the empty tomb, life emerging from death. Now, I have not been able to sell this in 35 years of ministry, but I would like to introduce a new symbol of the resurrection, and I call it the Easter oyster. Do we have a picture of an oyster to show? There it is. Isn't he pretty? I stand in awe of the first human ancestor to eat an oyster. They're not pretty. Their shells are rough and hard. They're full of sand and grit. They're about as Easter-like as a tulip bulb dying in the earth or perhaps an empty eggshell or a cocoon. Maybe one of our cave-dwelling ancestors watched a seagull scoop one up out of the brine and take it up into the air and drop it on a rock and open it and then stand and eat. 
or maybe they saw an otter enjoying its prey. But something compelled this ancient ancestor of ours to crack one of these things open and look at it and eat it. I cannot understand that. I am not an oyster eater. As ugly as they are on the outside, inside they are not much better. And let's be honest, they look kind of like snot. But people love them. And here we are this morning looking at an Easter. And what is an Easter oyster but a symbol of resurrection because inside the oyster, every now and then, you find a pearl. Pearls are formed by an irritant, usually some kind of parasite that gets inside the shell of the oyster. And nacre is the substance that lines its shell. And over a period of sometimes as many as three years, it will coat the irritant again and again and again until the pearl forms. And I really think this is a good symbol of Easter because it's born of pain. Jesus goes into the room with his disciples. He shows up. The doors are locked. They're scared to death. They're closed up tighter than an oyster shell. And yet he is in their midst. And he shows them willingly his scars, signs of his humanity that he still bears in his resurrected life. He shows them his scars, and he breathes not onto them, into them. Think about how John's gospel begins. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, which takes us back to in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth. God takes the dust of the earth and breathes life into it. Jesus is doing the same thing with the Holy Spirit, breathing new life into the church that he is forming in his name, into his disciples, although they are locked away in fear. Thomas is not with them. Now, we could say that Thomas was the brave one who was out into the world. Maybe he was the one who was the one with a short straw who had to go out and find food for them. Maybe he was out trying to hear what was happening if they were being hunted down because they had followed their Messiah. But he goes into the room and they say, we've seen the Lord, the same message that Mary had said just in the same chapter of John's Gospel when she tells the disciples that she has seen the Lord, but they do not believe her. And so they are continuously locked away until he comes and stands in their midst. Now he comes back again after Thomas says, until I see him for myself, until I touch those wounds, I will not believe. And Jesus returns again. The room is locked, but he just gets in there anyway. And he shows Thomas. And Thomas, unlike the other disciples, falls before him and praises him and proclaims him my Lord and my God. So here we are these years later, feeling a need to lock ourselves away, being told by the governor that we're supposed to keep ourselves locked away. Not forever, but in this time of pandemic, to keep us safe, to prevent this virus from spreading. But the good news in this story is that wherever we are, however isolated we may feel, however closed off we might be, Christ comes to us. He comes to us. It doesn't matter that the doors are locked. It doesn't matter that the walls are thick. He comes to us because he is no longer bound by time and space because he is the Lord who has been resurrected. But he still bears the scars of his human body. He still is willing to show us his scars. I've always said that knocking on someone's door and saying, are you saved, is not a way to share your faith in Jesus Christ. But showing your scars can be. I've often said, and I've said it here, that some of the best churches I've ever visited have been AA meetings, where people go and confess their brokenness, and in that confession find healing and grace and peace. I was amazed a few years ago when one of my parishioners stood up in church. She was a relatively new member of the church, but she stood up and proudly announced that she had received her 40-year chip from Alcoholics Anonymous. 40 years without taking a drink. No one knew that she had a drinking problem. No one knew that she attended AA meetings regularly, and she could have kept that hidden. But instead, she came into the church and stood up and said, I give thanks to my God for delivering me from alcohol. 40 years sober. You know what that did? It inspired other people who are still struggling to seek her out and to find out where she had got this healing, where she had received her peace and her grace. Because a scar 
is not a sign of woundedness. It is a sign of healing, of old wounds covered by grace. So what does that mean for us today? I think it's time for us to come out of our shells, people. It's time for us to open up to the grace of God in Jesus Christ because that is what transforms us. That is what makes us new. That is what breathes life into us from the Holy Spirit so that we might emerge a new creation. Maybe you're not going to look as pretty as a butterfly. Maybe you're still going to be an oyster because I know my hair has not done very well during these weeks of confinement. But God will bring something beautiful out of our pain and our suffering. God who comes to us wherever we are, no matter how far we think we've hidden from the Lord, Christ comes to us with new life, with hope, and with healing. Jesus didn't condemn Thomas. And Jesus must have remembered when everyone else looked at him as the doubter, that he was the one who just before they went back to Jerusalem said, let us go and die with him. He is the one who said to Jesus, how do we know the way? So that Jesus could say, I am the way and the truth and the life. Thomas is not the doubter, but the one who, when Christ comes to him, falls on his knees and proclaims him, my Lord and my God. May the same be said of each of us as we continue in this time of isolation, that Christ has come to us, has breathed new life into us, and through him we have been made whole we have been made beautiful, we have been healed. We may still bear the scars, but the scars are signs of Christ's new life in us. To the glory of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. I invite you now to join in singing. I want to uh, take a moment to uh, thank Kara, 
uh, our administrative assistant here at Epworth, uh, who has been doing so much uh, during this time of quarantine to help us and keep us straight and make sure things are taken care of here at the church. One of the things that she does is uh, collects the joys and concerns that have come in and puts them together so that we have those to be able to share on Sunday mornings. And uh, she sent me a quick email with, uh, with a list. Um, so thank you, Kara, for that. And I want to thank everyone for sharing these so that we can be um, in this together and getting through it together by sharing uh, prayers with and for one another. So our joys for this morning, the first one, uh, actually both come from Carol Sullivan. The first, she says, I asked for prayers for my cousin's wife, Sonia. She was supposed to have two surgeries three months apart. The first surgery was delayed to, due to her having a fever. She finally had the first surgery and is feeling great. She is trying to walk a few miles a day. The second surgery is not needed. So praise God for that. The second uh, joy that she shares is Sabrina and Alex are expecting twin boys in July. Sabrina is one of my dearest friend's youngest daughter. So uh, joy for Sabrina and Alex and their expectant twins. Um, our concerns uh, for today, and this is a longer list. The first comes from Frida. And she shares uh, Kay, Kay Ely's sister, Akita, um, who lives in Tucson, Arizona, is experiencing some cognitive disorientation, uh, seeing and hearing things and people that aren't really there uh, and aren't really happening. She's having web medical appointments, but there's concern that this problem may, may not uh, be easily diagnosed as it isn't fully apparent all the time. So please keep Akita in your prayers and Kay as she worries for um, her sister. Uh, prayers of healing are requested for Elaine Jones, wife of former um, Epworth United Methodist pastor, uh, Reverend Jeff Jones, who tested positive for COVID-19. She seems to be improving, but still not over it yet. So please be in prayer for her. Uh, continued prayers for Ross Myers uh, and Kim, um, since Ross's cancer has reoccurred. And uh, he began his chemo treatments, um, and so far things are going well with that, but please keep them in prayer. Um, for Dady Sartorio's sister, Dixie Little, recuperating from a stroke. For families separated, for safety, especially those with family members who don't understand. For health care and other frontline workers who put themselves at risk. For patients, for parents and grandparents trying to be teachers in this time of quarantine. And uh, with the new news that came out about schools uh, being out extended into May, May 15th, uh, pray for our students as well. For strength of caretakers who don't get a break. For graduating seniors missing their expected activities. For my friend Wendy, and this comes from Alexa, for my friend Wendy healing from an undiagnosed illness. Uh, also from Alexa, for her friend Leslie, uh, relief from pain in hospice care. For patience and assurance for all of us concerned about the fragility and uncertainty of life. I lifted up a prayer uh, for Tom Price. He's the former director of youth ministry for our conference. Um, he, along with Pam and I were instrumental in making the Rock Retreat a conference-wide youth retreat. He has been battling cancer for some time now and has recently entered home hospice care. So please pray for him and his wife, Becky. Um, and also prayers for Margie and Frank, and this comes from Carol Sullivan. She says, Frank has cancer in five or six organs. He is getting treatments he was given four months to live two months ago. His wife, Margie, has a lot of health issues and does not like to be uh, alone. 
She has a relative stay with her whenever Frank, uh, whenever Frank was out of town. Um, so please keep them, Margie and Frank, in your prayers. Um, I also ask that we lift up, uh, we have members in our congregation that have loved ones that are suffering from COVID-19. Please keep them in your prayers for healing and for the family uh, as they worry. It's not as usual where we can gather with those we loved when they're um, going through difficult times. The distancing makes it that much harder. So please keep them in your prayers. And I also ask that you be in prayer for members of our congregation whose jobs are being uh, dramatically affected by this time of shutdown and quarantine. Um, the stress of that is unimaginable. So please uh, keep them in your prayers. Um, so that's all the that's all the prayers that were uh, were shared uh, through the church office. We ask that you please uh, continue to uh, send those in. Um, and I have one other thing that I would like to share with all of you today. Um, as I've shared before, my journey to ministry began with a call. Uh, from God to leave what I was doing before and go into something uh, brand new. And that call continued uh, to become a full-time youth pastor at Oakdale Emory United Methodist Church, and then another call uh, that called me to come here to Epworth United Methodist Church. And I am so thankful uh, for God calling me uh, to be here but I need to share with you that after uh, an extended period of time of personal prayer and prayer with my family, uh, we have discerned a, that God is calling me to a, a new ministry, a new uh, situation. On July 1st, I will uh, begin ministry as the pastor of a two-point charge, which are two churches that share one pastor uh, that'll be in Red Lion, Pennsylvania, part of the Susquehanna Conference. I realize that there is, I've realized more and more and in conversation with Pastor Terry that there is no good time uh, to share news like this. Uh, and I'm sorry that we have to be distant at this time um, in sharing this, but I want you all to know uh, this was not an easy decision. As I reflect, Nathan was, had just turned one years old when we came to Epworth. So uh, during this time, I've raised my family here. Joelle was born while I've been here in ministry and was baptized right here in the sanctuary. Um, you all have loved and cared for me through seminary um, and through ordination and through so many other things that you've You've made me a part of your family and a part of your heart, and you are a part of mine and always will be. Um, while I am very thankful for this opportunity, it is kind of scary too. It's going from youth ministry to uh, leading the ministry of a church, and um, I am in need of your prayers uh, for all of that. It is a new journey. Um, and... Wow, <laughs> it's hard to, hard to share all this with you, but um, I just wanted you to, to know and be aware how much I love you, how much you are a part of my heart and will continue to be. Um, and I ask for your, um, for your prayers, for your love, uh, and for your support in this new journey. Um, and I look forward to the time that we're no longer quarantined and we can come together and take time to reflect and, and celebrate. But once again, uh, I thank you. I thank you for the love and support that you've given to me and my family for so many years. And uh, the other thing I just want to share is I really believe that while there's no good time, that this is actually a good time in the church. 
You have a wonderful, experienced lead pastor in Pastor Terry, uh, who is committed to be here for the long haul. Uh, and we haven't had that for a while. Um, the other thing is you've got, I, I'm very blessed to have a team of adult leaders uh, that have worked with me and learned with me over several years in uh, loving and caring for the youth ministry of this church that continue to be committed to doing the same thing. And that also goes for the Sunday school teachers as well. So I truly believe that even though my presence won't be here, that uh, my ministries are in great hands. And for mission teams that I led, Mike has been doing that for a while now and is a fantastic leader of the mission team. So I'm, I know full well that even that will go well. But um, again, um, sorry, there is no good time. Uh, but I do thank you once again. And as I said before, I continue to ask for your prayers in all of this. So thank you. We're going to pray. But first, I would like to thank Bill for the years of service he has given this church. He's given his heart here. We had a meeting of the conference this morning via Zoom, and there were, I think, 800 people on the call. And one of the things that the bishop was asked was, for those pastors in transition in this appointment year, will we be able to gather, even if we're not in worship until July, which could happen, although we're hoping that it does not. I'd already told Bill, it doesn't matter when he goes, he has to start his new appointment on July 1st. It doesn't matter if we're together then or not. He's going to come back and we're going to celebrate his years of ministry in a huge way because you can't let 18 years of faithful, loving service go quietly into the night. And if that's, if we're able to gather and we still can't hug Bill, can you come back again and let us hug you in a year? Amen. I know how hard this is for you because transition is part of the life of an elder in the church and, and Bill is going to be serving as a pastor now. He's going to be serving in that capacity. And it is so hard to say goodbye to a church that you loved. My last congregation was the sanctuary where I was married and also the sanctuary where I let my husband's life be celebrated and buried him at his funeral from that same chancel. Church has become part of us and we've become part of churches. But I need you now to know that what is for us, as we say, joys and concerns, a sorrow for us is a blessing for Bill. And I'm going to ask you now, raise your hand, your right hand toward your television. And I want you to pray with me. Holy God, holy and merciful, we ask your blessing on your son, Bill, who has given his life in service to your church, to his Savior. And for the years he's been at Appworth Church, we have been blessed, we have been built, we have been strengthened. For the lives of every young person whose heart he touched with the gospel of grace and redeeming love of our Savior, we praise you. We thank you for the weddings that he has conducted, for the mission trips that he's led, for the retreats that he has endured sometimes without sleep day after day. For the love and the care that he has given us, we thank you and we praise you. And now we ask that you would bless Bill. Bless him in this new endeavor. Bless him as he says goodbye to a church he loves to answer more fully the call that you've placed upon his heart so that we might let him go with joy and thanksgiving even while our hearts are aching because we trust you, Holy Lord. And now, Lord, we lift before you the concerns that were shared here this morning, the joys of health being restored, but also the concerns for those we love. We have so many in our congregation who are grieving right now. We have so many who are waiting for news about test results. We have so many whose surgeries were postponed. We have so many people in isolation whose hearts are yearning to be with others, to share the love that you've given us. We have folks here who have not been touched by another human being in weeks, who long for the days when we could hug and embrace and shake hands and laugh together. God, you have come to us in Jesus Christ for such a time as this. So fill our hearts now that we might trust in your word and your promises until we're together again. Be with us, guide us, strengthen us. Breathe your Holy Spirit into our hearts again and again that we might proclaim you as our Lord and our God. For all that you have blessed us with, we thank you. 
for the ability to worship even remotely. We give you our thanks and praise, and we remember those before us who went through the 1918 flu epidemic without the ability to have any contact at all with their communities of faith. For this, even though it's weird and strange and foreign to us, we are able to see one another, to be with one another in heart, and reminded that you are our God, that you will redeem and restore us until we can be together again. For all these things, we bless you and we praise your holy name. And as our Lord Christ taught us, so we join with him in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be thy be name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come. come. Thy, thy will, will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And, and forgive us our trespasses, us trespasses as we forgive, forgive those who trespass, trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hello, my name is Catherine Kuwabara, and I'm the chair of the Staff Parish Relation Committee. Like many of you right now, I too was in shock when Bill first told me about his new calling from God that would take him away from Epworth. I went through the emotions of sadness and disbelief. Bill has provided Epworth with stability and love for the past 18 years. And personally, he has helped me through some rough times with my family. I have actually had some time to process the news. At Epworth, we have had the privilege of watching Bill grow in his ministry. We have supported him through his ordination journey. We see the amazing relationships he has helped the youth, young adults, and for that matter, many of the older parishioners develop with group Jesus and he has become part of Epworth's family. For many parishioners, Bill has been part of your baptism of your children, officiated your wedding, and cried with you at a hospital bed or funeral. He has celebrated the youth achievements and watched them grow into strong, young Christian men and women. I guess now I look at Bill's listening to God's calling, not as if he's leaving Epworth, but he is actually taking part of Epworth's faith and love for Jesus Christ and sharing with a new congregation in Pennsylvania. It is sort of like a parent in sending a young child off to college or to live on their own. There is sadness for the loss, but you also celebrate their growth and their future. God has a new plan for Bill, and I am sure Bill will thrive where he is going. I know many of you may be asking, so what is next with Upworth's youth program and ministries? Bill has taken pride in training and mentoring the youth and ministry leaders so that the programs have a foundation to continue once he is gone. And for that, I'm grateful. We will figure out how to work through this together with the strength of God. In closing, Please keep Bill, Pam, Nathan, and Joelle in your prayers, as well as our youth and our youth and ministry leaders. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to call Reverend Terry or myself. God bless and please stay safe. We invite you now to join with us in hymn number 327 in the United Methodist Hymnal, Crown Him with Many Crowns.
beloved, we are so blessed. I know that's a hard thing to, to say right now with uncertainty and everything else, but even in the passages of scripture, we have a savior that comes through locked doors and doesn't let anything, even death, separate himself from his love and his presence with each and every one of us. And that is the hope of this time. That is the hope that we need to hold on to. That is the hope that will guide us through, that we have a powerful God who powerfully loves us and will do everything in his power to make that known for us. So let us seek that uh, in this time and know that God's will will always get us through. So with that, go in peace, beloved. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.